Hey, hey, party people, it's Lycona de Chichi, and welcome to the Easy Peasy Guide for Pandemonium, Asphodelos, The Fourth Circle, Savage, Phase 2, or better known as P4S. Before we get started, just know that if you leave at any point during this phase, you're gonna have to defeat the door boss again. A good rule of thumb is that if you haven't beaten the door boss yet and you have 100 minutes left on the timer, go ahead and reset the instance so that when you do clear the door boss, you have ample time to progress in this phase. We set up our markers like this, and they're really only important for one single mechanic in the fight. It's probably the most difficult to wrap your head around, but just remember to focus on your own mechanics and what you need to do, and you'll be alright. We'll need to set up standard clock positions, as well as left and right groups. These groups will need to be flexible with the rolls. Don't worry, once the mechanic comes up, we'll go over who needs to be in what group. Pull Hesper to the middle, and he'll cast Searing Stream, which is a raid-wide AoE. Then he'll cast Akinthal, Act 1. During the cast, there are 8 towers and 4 AoEs that appear on the Cardinals. Don't worry, all of this stuff doesn't explode right now. The fight is just telling you what will go off in a few moments. As all the AoEs disappear, the boss will throw down dark red feathers on the stage. These feathers simply indicate the location of the mechanics we just saw, those AoEs and the towers. The boss will then tether to the feathers in a certain order, and this order determines which feathers mechanic will go off. This happens all throughout the fight, and it's much easier done than said. After all those AoEs and the towers disappear and the feathers come down, he'll cast Searing Stream again. At this point, we want to get into our groups, and here's how we do it. We have the tanks and range up north on the boss's face, and we have the melees and healers on the south on the butt. He'll then cast Wraith of Thorns, in which he'll tether to two feathers at either the north, south, or east, west. These feather mechanics are the first to go off, and they're AoEs, with the boss facing north. If the first tethers come out on the east and west, we have our group start at north and south. If the tethers come out on the north and south, we have our group rotate clockwise 90 degrees, and then we treat our new setup as the new north for the rest of this mechanic. In other words, while the setup could be different, how you handle the next mechanics for either setup is exactly the same. See this diamond right here? You can stand on this and not get hit by the AoEs that go off. Once you're in your setup spots, assign who goes left and who goes right. You will also want to assign who takes the front towers and who takes the back towers. For our group on my side, we have one tank take the left tower and one tank take the right tower, while the DPS in the back, one will take the left and one will take the right. On the other side, the melees and the healers will do the same thing. One melee will take the left tower while the other melee takes the right tower, and one healer will take their left tower and the other healer will take their right tower. Once the AoEs go off, move towards your tower, wait a moment for them to go off, then continue in your direction to finish the quarter circle to dodge those last AoEs. Remember, you can use this diamond here as a marker to avoid the second explosions. After those AoEs go off, the next mechanic will be the main tank buster for this fight. The boss will cast either Near Sight or Far Sight. These tank busters both hit the tanks at the same time, are medium-sized AoEs so the tanks can't stack together, and are baited by distance, hence the Near and Far. And you guessed it, if he casts Near Sight, the tanks will want to be closest to the boss while the party is far away, and if he casts Far Sight, the tank should be the furthest away while the party stacks underneath. Next, he'll cast Akanthai Act 2, where you'll see four AoEs and four towers appear. And this is where our markers come into play. If you notice, we have the towers on the lettered markers and the numbered markers on the AoEs. The AoEs will disappear and the boss will then cast Demigod Double. It's a tank buster that must be shared and mitigated, but one tank can use their invulnerability and take the full hit. Then he'll cast Wraith of Thorns. There are two tether patterns he can choose to do. And before we continue onward, rather than telling you how all the mechanics work in concert, I'm just going to tell you what we do as a group because it's worked for us every single time. For our marker placement with the boss facing north, if you get this pattern where the north tether is on the A marker, do this mechanic with north being true north. If the north tether is on the one marker and you get this pattern, we rotate clockwise 90 degrees. And now, the B and 2 markers are the new north for just this mechanic. After that one setup adjustment, everything else in this mechanic is handled exactly the same. The tanks, healers, and DPS all have different mechanics to play, so let's go over each one of the roles in order. Also for this, I'll be using true north represented by our A and 1 marker placements. For the tanks, you'll either get a fire crystal on your head, or nothing. 
If you have nothing, you're going to go immediately towards the northwest at the edge of the stage and stand in between the 4 and the A marker. Once the AoE underneath you goes off, get into the A tower clockwise from your spot. After the towers explode, go clockwise again and stand on the B marker. After that, you're finished. If you're the tank that gets the fire crystal on your head, you're going to wait in the middle. After the AoE goes off underneath you, move north towards the one marker and stack with the other two DPS. After the giant AoEs go off, rotate counterclockwise and stack on the four marker and take the shared damage with the healer and the DPS. After that, you're finished. For the healers, you will either get a red fire crystal or a purple lightning crystal above your head. For the lightning crystal healer or the purple crystal, you're going to go immediately southeast towards the edge of the stage, in between the C and the 2 marker. After the AoE goes off underneath you, move to the C marker and stand in the tower. After the giant AoEs go off, you're going to move clockwise to the D marker and stand in the tower there. After that, you're finished. For the healer with the red fire crystal on their head, you're going to wait in the middle. When the AoE underneath you goes off, make your way south and stand on the 3 marker with the other 2 DPS. After that giant AoE goes off, you're going to move clockwise to the 4 marker and stand with the other tank and DPS. After that, you're finished. For the DPS, you will either get a red fire crystal or a blue wind crystal on your head. For the two DPS with the blue wind crystals, you're going to wait in the middle. When the AoE underneath you goes off, make your way north and stand on the one marker. Once the giant AoEs go off, go clockwise to the two marker and stack with the other DPS. After that, you're finished. For the two DPS who get the red fire crystals on their head, you're going to wait in the middle. When the AoE underneath you goes off, you're going to go south and stand on the three marker. After the giant AoEs go off, one DPS will go clockwise to the four marker and one DPS will go counterclockwise to the two marker. We assign one or two DPS to flex left or right, depending on your partner who gets the red crystal, so just be aware of that. And after all that, you're finished. For Akanthai Act 2, there's a lot of stuff going on. But what helped our group out is that we just focused on our own mechanic and where we need to go. The marker placement helps with positioning. Also note that you have to look at the crystal above your head. There's no debuff indicator on the party list. And also note that when you're moving from spot to spot, you can still hit the boss. The good news is that this Act 2 mechanic is arguably the hardest mechanic to do in this fight. So once you and your party have it down, the rest of the mechanics in the fight are way easier. And in the description below, I'll put the written text we used for this mechanic, which can help you better understand the details. Once all the mechanics have gone off, come back to the middle and the boss will cast Ultimate Impulse, which is a raid-wide AoE. At this point, we face the boss either towards the east or the west. It's up to you. He'll then cast Akanthai Act 3, where he'll spawn four towers on the east edge, four towers on the west edge, and a knockback coming from the center. Same as the last two big mechanics, just ignore the knockback and the tower AoE indicators for now. The feathers will drop down from the sky on the mechanics and he'll cast Wraith of Thorns. He'll tether to either the east or west towers first and then the opposite side. For our setup, we have two healers and two ranged DPS start under the first set of tethers that spawn. The two healers take the two center spots while the ranged DPS either take the left or the right position. On the second set of tethers that come out, the melees and the off tank will take the far left or far right tether position while the main tank stands right in the middle. You can use the tether and the boss's hit ring as a cross marker to position your character. Make sure that everyone is on the boss's hit ring as well. Once your party is set up, Hesper will then cast Torthonos Kick. This targets the furthest person away from the boss. During this cast, one tank will have to disengage and move to this exact spot here at the tip of the triangle on the stage. It's the perfect position for the boss with the next sequence of mechanics. When he jumps to the farthest person away, he'll do an AoE kick. It's about as big as his hitbox, so you don't want to be in too close to him. Right after that AoE goes off, the tanks will need to swap positions while the DPS stand on either side around that side arrow indicator on the boss's hitbox. He'll cast three Earthshakers at the same time. Whoever is closest to the boss will take an Earthshaker hit. The tank who swapped takes an Earthshaker standing on the front of the boss and points it towards the outside of the stage, while the melees stand on opposite flanks, right where the side arrows are on the boss's hit ring, and take their Earthshaker hits there. 
At the same time, on the opposite side of the stage, once the boss jumps to the main tank, that's when the healers and the ranged DPS go stand in their towers. The Earthshakers and healer ranged DPS towers go off at the same time, and at this point, you want to pop your anti-knockbacks, except for the main tank who took the first kick. That tank will have to go to the center feather and get ready to get knocked back into their tower. The center feather has to be taken, so we have the main tank do it. The melees and the other tanks will also get in their towers at this time. Note that whichever tower you take is the same when you lined up underneath your tether on the boss's hit ring. Right after the knockback goes off, on the opposite side, assign one healer to take the next jump and AoE kick from the boss. Again, he'll jump to the furthest person away, so you can stand on the tip of the triangle for positioning. The ranged DPS and other healer can kind of chill near the middle, so you don't accidentally bait the boss, but once the boss jumps, he'll do the same thing as before and cast three Earthshakers. The healers swap positions, while the ranged DPS hang out on each flank to take the Earthshakers, and you're all finished. Next, pull the boss out slightly towards the middle, and the tanks will get either the near sight or the far sight tank buster, so everyone watch out for those. Heart Stake comes out next, which is a double hit tank buster that targets the first and second enmity or aggro spots in the party, and applies a bleed debuff. The tank gets hit hard, so you want to amp up the healing and shielding here. In the description below, there's a bit more of an explanation on how we do this mechanic. Next, we'll get ready for Akanthai Act 4. Searing Stream comes out next, which is the raid-wide AoE, and then let's dive into Act 4. This mechanic is a bit of a dance. You'll see the feathers on the outside of the stage. Just know that they're spaced out in your usual clock positions. Everyone in the party will get a crystal on their head, four people will get the purple lightning crystal, and four people will get the blue wind crystal. You'll also get a tether that's attached to one of the feathers at the edge of the stage. Here's how we handle this mechanic. Make sure that the boss is centered in the middle of the stage before you start. We use the boss's hitbox ring to position ourselves for this first part. If you get a blue wind crystal above your head, you're going to go to the opposite side of your tether, then rotate one spot clockwise to the next feather. In other words, you're going to put your tether through the boss and then stand on his hit ring. Rotate one spot over clockwise to that feather, and that's your spot. If you get a purple lightning crystal above your head, you're going to go towards your tether and then rotate one spot clockwise to the next feather over. If everyone is in position, the tether pattern kind of looks like this. At this point, everyone should just hang out at the boss's hit ring for a moment while he casts Searing Stream. When Searing Stream explodes, that's when everybody will head straight into their own feather at the edge of the stage. Wait in the towers until they explode, the tethers on the four people with the blue wind crystals will break, the four people with the purple lightning crystals will still be attached to their tethers. At this point, the party heads towards south and you'll want to hang out around the boss's hit ring. Whoever's tether is at north or northwest, that person will break their tether first. You break the tether by the usual way, running opposite your tether until it turns red and then it will break. Once your tether breaks, the tower that it was attached to will explode with a giant AoE around it. Then we rotate clockwise around the boss, breaking tethers one at a time. If you have a tether, just pay attention to if you're next and break your tether. Once a tether breaks, everyone in the party will get a magic vulnerability stack, so you can't break these tethers at the same time. Don't worry, that magic vuln stack drops off after about two seconds, so it's really quick. If you're not breaking tethers, you can stay around the boss's hit ring and just continue to hit him. Rotate clockwise around the boss and with the party. Be careful not to get greedy and go too close to the middle. You want to avoid getting hit with the feather explosion when somebody breaks their tethers. For melees, you will have to disengage in order to break your tethers for when or if it's your turn. After you break the last four tethers, the boss will cast Ultimate Impulse, which is a raid-wide AoE. Searing Stream comes out next, which is another raid-wide AoE. Next up, he'll cast Akenthal Finale, which we like to call this mechanic, Can You Count? Wraith of Thorns comes out and everyone will get a tether on them. The first thing to do here is to go to your feather that you're attached to with your tether and then get into this configuration. Melees and tanks at the front, ranged DPS and healers at the back. The boss will then throw out eight AoEs and hit each party member one at a time. When the first AoE explodes on the party member, that's when you start counting from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on the count, whichever AoE you got hit with. That's your number. After the eighth hit, come to the middle and pay attention to the first tether he puts on a feather. That feather is number one. 
The other tethers will then come out going around clockwise in a circle, attaching themselves to the feathers. And if you're following along, you guessed it, the next feather will be two, then three, then four, and so on. Whatever number count you got hit with the AoE from before, that's your tower that you're going to stand in and take this mechanic. The towers go off rather slowly clockwise, so just make sure you're not moving around or out of your towers before they explode. Next up we have the double tank buster, near sight or far sight, so party and tanks adjust accordingly. Limit break 3 should be up at this point, so use it if you can, and the boss will cast Searing Stream. Demigod double is the shared tank buster that comes out next. And finally, Hesper will cast Akinthal Curtain Call. For this mechanic, it's easy to understand, but tricky to execute. Pull the boss back into the middle and everyone will get a purple lightning crystal on their head and get tethered to one of the feathers around the edge of the stage. You'll want to go directly opposite of your tether. In other words, pull your tether directly through the middle of the boss and stand on the boss's hit ring. This will be your new hangout spot for the rest of this mechanic. The way this works is what you have to do is you have to break these tethers one at a time by going to the feather closest to your position at the edge of the stage. There's also a timer debuff that appears on everyone, so you have to break your tether before your timer runs out. There will also be sneaky AoEs, or double dodge AoEs as we call them, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but first let's go over who explodes their tethers first because double dodging the AoEs comes naturally afterwards. Everyone will get timers on them. For the DPS, you'll either get 42, 32, 22, or 12. For the tanks and healers, it's a bit more consistent. The two tanks will always get 12 or 32, while the healers will always get 22 or 42. You really don't need to worry about your original timer numbers, but when your timers get down to around 12 seconds, that's when you should prepare to break your tethers. A DPS will always break their tether around the 12 second mark, while a tank or a healer will break their tether around the six second mark. And here's the order of who in the party breaks their tethers. It always starts with a DPS who has the 12 second timer on them. They go and break their tether immediately. Then the tank with the 12 second timer, whose timer should be around six seconds after the DPS broke theirs, will break their tether next while double dodging the AoEs or a protein wave that comes out. The next group to break is a DPS with 12 seconds left on their timer, then a healer with six seconds left on their timer. The next DPS goes, and then the tank, while also dodging the double AoEs, goes. And finally, the last DPS and healer. The guideline here is that a DPS breaks their tether while they have about 12 seconds left on their timers, while the tanks and healers break their tethers while they have about 6 seconds left on their timers. And I say about 12 or 6 seconds because you don't want to rely strictly on breaking your tether exactly on those time marks. You have to watch the party for the magic vulnerability debuff, the party HP might be low, people might be double dodging the AoEs that come out, somebody might take a tower a little bit early or a little bit late, a healer might be casting their heals to top up the party. There's plenty of time to adjust when breaking your tethers, so just be mindful of all of your party surroundings before you just blindly break your tethers at 12 and at the 6 second mark. For when the protein waves come out, they'll always come out when the tanks are breaking their tethers. Dodge the marked AoEs first and then move into the middle of the black stuff to dodge the second sneaky AoEs. We call it the double dodge and always remember to double dodge here and just play it safe because if you get clipped with one of those AoEs, it's usually all over. Not to worry though, dodging AoEs are easy, just focus up and double dodge and you'll be fine. Another tip that helps our party out with the timers is that if you look at the first number, that number indicates which DPS and tank healer group set will go and break their tethers at that time. The key to this mechanical wizardry that helped me out is patience. Don't go too early, don't go too late, and just go precisely when you mean to. Next up, you have to do this entire mechanic again, and it's exactly the same. You might have a new position depending on your tether, and you might have different debuff timers. But if you did the first one, then you can do the second one, no problem. You'll also want to plan out your mitigations for the two rounds of curtain call with your party. After your party breaks the last tether for the last mechanic, the boss will cast Ultimate Impulse, which is the raid-wide AoE, so use all of your remaining mitigation here, and finally, he'll cast his Enrage, which is another Ultimate Impulse. And if your DPS was on point, congratulations on your clear and completing the first raid tier of the Endwalker expansion. This boss fight for us was one of the easiest that we've done, and it's kind of reflected in the community on how fast everyone cleared it. It took us about three lockouts, or roughly three to four hours of progression on this boss. One thing that we did, like, if you reach the counting numbers mechanic, where you have to count those AoE hits and then stand in the circle, 
once you hit that mechanic and you get down the last one, you're, you're in for the clear. Like, you can do it, no problem. As always, I'd like to thank my raid group, all of our friends on Behemoth, and our raid leader Venom for doing a lot of the research on this fight for us. I'd like to also thank the Final Fantasy Raid community and those honorary ninth members who watched us on stream and helped give us advice during our runs. We are truly grateful. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank you for watching and I hope you found this guide helpful so you can go get your clear. So until next time, keep an eye out for the next Ultimate Raid and keep on adventuring. Yeah, I got a question. Um, so Tiger and I had uh, our thingamaboppers and to what, resolve- what, what, what does that mean? Fire the Susada, and then go, you guys take your Earth Shakers? Oh, I am Whoa! way out. Oh! Oh, oh, I made it! I'm alive! <laughs> Who got yeeted? Top five, like, kind of. Yep, yep. Damn, damn it. No, like, that, that was too slow. There, I yeah, know, I know. It's okay, God. it's okay. Ah! I'm just saying what we I was thinking about steak. No, I really wasn't. Oh, steak! I hope you weren't actually. I wasn't. This is a fucking take. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. God damn. It. Fuck steak. Every food, if you have to. Fuck steak. Oh, fuck steak. <laughs> fuck steak sounds like a fucking metal band. Ooh. Remember Mimi and Lachi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna what? die for that. Well, what was that you wanted us to remember? Okay, safe side. Max melee. Remember on the diamond. You're a diamond. Oh, thanks, buddy. Anytime, buddy. Hey. I messed like, up. Like, hold on! <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna be here for a long fucking while? I literally forgot the first one. I'm a diamond, guys! I'm a diamond! <laughs> Fuck. To be fair, to be fair, so Tiger right. was looking rather suspicious on our side. I, just, like, I forgot the timing, and then I saw Pally run, and I was like, where's he going? But that must have been a position. When I ran straight to the other safe spot, I was like, this doesn't feel right. I'm off somehow. <laughs> There's something missing in the There's middle. There's something missing here. Jeez. Uh...